We've got our brother Robert Thor back, and uh, we're glad to have him. And of course, right after the service tonight, he's going to be heading back to Florida, right? And that's uh, Kobe drunk. He's uh, trying to get out ahead of the, the storm. So, yeah. so anyway, we're thankful that he said, no, I got, I, I'm stopping at Oak before I go home. Yeah, so, so, we're right. so thank you. Yes. <laughs> I'm just so happy to be here, amen? Amen. And especially since it's the Christmas season where we uh, rejoice in the birth of our Lord. Amen. And when the angels proclaim that unto you this day is born in the city of David, as we turn to 1 John chapter 2. The Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Amen. And then on the eighth day, what ended up happening? When he was circumcised, he was given a name that the angel said he would be called before he was born, and that is Amen. Jesus. So just in that angelic proclamation, we see who he was in his purpose, that he is the Savior. We see who he is in his identity, and that was the Jewish people believed that the Messiah would come, the promised one. And then we also see, by way of his title, Lord, when the angel proclaimed his coming, the angel wanted you and I to know before he entered Mary's womb. From eternity past, as God he had inhabited heaven. And I, as an angel, with all angels, stood round about him, crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Amen. And then finally in his name, Jesus, the angel proclaimed to Joseph, that is what you to name your baby boy. Because why? He shall save his people from their sins. You also recall another name that he gave to Joseph that he would be called. He said, Isaiah said he would be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted as what? God, God with us. And so, Jesus, this Christmas season, is who we celebrate. But I want to take us to 1 John chapter 2 and consider something. Once a person asks Jesus in their heart, what should be their spiritual progression as far as maturity and development? But before we begin, we may be praying. Father, we pray that the precious blood of Jesus Christ be cleanse us. We pray that the Holy Spirit of God would be ungrieved, unquenched, rather be an anointed with uh, understanding of the word he spoke and helped others right. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, you'd examine our individual hearts, may the precious blood of Christ cleanse us, may any spirit that would hinder be rebuked, and may Christ be exalted, may Jesus become so precious to us. For we praise you and thank you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I'd like to thank the Lord for being here, and uh, some of you may have been to uh, the website, and that's how it was spiritual development. I just put another uh, resource on there. Three years of free Bible education if you want to get a Bible education for free. And that's my third mill. And uh, it's recently being redeveloped. It's nativemi.org, Native Ministry International. And it's to assist natives. The interesting thing uh, here. Uh, when uh, the meetings were here, I'd get responses, and this is being broadcast again here. And just to let you know, I'm at Olin, 
Baptist Church in Iron in Oberlin, Louisiana. Amen. Now, believe it or not, there'll be tribes around the country. There'll be people in Florida. There'll be people in Minnesota. There'll be people in Wisconsin. There'll be people in Illinois. There's going to be people in Malawi, Africa. There's going to be people in Kenya, Africa. There's going to be people in Southern Africa. There's going to be people in Pakistan. There's going to be people in India. There's going to be people all around the world who, in the coming days, will interact with me and tell me they saw things. Amen. So God is using his word and using the internet. Now, one thing, pray with me about. I've got a challenge to us in belief, belief in God. Now, I've been trying to go to every reservation. I'm 66 years old. You know how tired you get when you're 66 years old? <laughs> I've been to 30 reservations in this past summer. I went to 18, 48 days. My wife said, We're still married and I didn't kill him. <laughs> So you try to ride in the cab of a uh, truck with your spouse for 48 days and, and uh, 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 you praise of Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, there's 327 reservations. And I provide a service to every native nation by way of having all the native tribes available. We condense them so a tribal government can go to one page and find eight different ways of seeing uh, how to find a nation. When I walk into tribal government, I tell them I'm going to provide something new to you. What's new? How to connect with the native tribes. So what we've got that is not really. What do you mean not really? I said, all you've got is the regional district that you're in. There's 12 of them, which means there are 11 of them that you cannot access. And then I pull out the phone and I show them all the dots on the map of all the tribes. They said, we don't have that. And I show them the United States. And I say, click a state. And they'll typically click, click their state. If I'm in New Mexico, that's what they click. If I'm in Utah, oh, that's what they click. Montana, South Dakota. Oklahoma, Michigan, Wisconsin, North Carolina, South Carolina, and so on and so forth, all of uh, Nebraska, wherever I happen to be driving, and I'm having fun. And all the tribes will appear. In Kansas, or in uh, uh, Oklahoma, there'll be 39 tribes populated there. And then there are other ways of doing it. So uh, they're happy to get it because I give it free. I was asked to develop the site and I uh, said I'll develop it on one condition. They said, what is it? I said, whatever I develop, you cannot charge the first native for. So how are we gonna monetize that? Not my problem. Have free development. And then you're gonna have to give it away free to every native that I give it to you. So one way to get it into the tribal areas, nations, I did an experiment in the last several months. Facebook, I authorized an ad into the Lakota, which is Pine Ridge, South Dakota. And within a couple of weeks, $30 contacted about 440 something natives on that reservation. And I sent it up to the Atlanta Reservation. And for $25, another 400 and something natives responded to the Facebook advertising. Now, I did the math. 327 reservations. And let's just round it out to $25. We could get the website and with that, all the helps for people with drug addiction, 
through people with suicide problems, free counseling, free anything and everything out there, free gospel, free spiritual growth, how to deal with spirits, and that's big on reservations. And trust me, it's big now in white churches. I told Dr. Jim Henry, First Baptist of Orlando, when he used to pass there in 1990, I said, in Native America, I said, you're seeing a number of things. You're seeing the complete breakdown of the household where the single parents or, you know, not even married. And I said, you're seeing a lot of spirits, spiritual issues. And I said, Native Americans are about three to four generations ahead of white Americans. And all I've got to say, and I don't want to say congratulations, but congratulations, white America. You just about caught up with natives where they were in 1990. And that's not a proud thing to say. So, 327 times 25 equals what? $8,500. That we can get the gospel out into every reservation. Why is that important? Six, 55 to 60 percent of all Native nations do not have the first church on there to help them. So when there's a Native teenager and she's dealing or he's dealing with depression, suicidal thoughts, and oftentimes it's just not suicidal thoughts in and of themselves. They've uh, helped some teens that on um, one particular reservation survived trying to hang themselves, and they said, what was going through your mind? Well, mom and dad, they're alcoholic, or, you know, dad's in jail or prison, and uh, all the abuse in the house and all this, I just wanted to end it all. And in my bedroom appeared a black spirit and that black spirit said, if you want to end it, go ahead. It'll be okay. Just go ahead and hang yourself. And the child did that. And by God's grace, survived. Somebody got there in time to rescue. That wasn't the first child. Second child said the same thing. Third child said the same thing. And I had an adult. I was ministering on a reservation. And uh, that adult said, I was walking down the street and my aunt appeared to me and said, come to the happy hunting ground. It's time to come home. He says, I was walking on the bridge and I knew supposedly my aunt wanted me to throw myself off that bridge and end my life. I said, do you know who that was? He says, who? I said, the Bible calls them a familiar spirit imitating our loved ones. Amen. The thief, the spirits, Satan comes out but to <coughs> steal, kill, and destroy. Amen. And the creator who made the spirits, one third fell with the most beautiful angel, Lucifer, fell with him. Now, comes on this earth, there's fallen demons, or as people will say, spirit gods. You, some of you even watch TV, where on doctor shows, the dead wife always appears. And some of you watch uh, other, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, NCIS, uh, where the policeman, you know, sees a dead family member. We have to be biblical. The Bible says for a believer in Jesus Christ to be absent from the body is what? Be present. Let's be present with the Lord. So if your loved one died, where are they? Luke 16 says about the lost one, if they're dead, they're separated and burning, and it describes, please take a, your finger 
with some water, put it on my tongue. So the dead spirits have gone to heaven or gone to hell. So spiritually, what do you and I need to know? How can we evaluate what we're encountering? First John chapter 2 verse 12 Arise you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Arise you to fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. Arise you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto your little children because you've known the Father. I've written unto you fathers because you've known him that is from the beginning. I've written unto you young men because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you overcome the wicked one. There are three levels of spirituality. The first level is just being described as the child. He's concerned with forgiveness. The second level is described as a young man, and he's described as learning how to overcome. And secondly, learning how to overcome with the Word of God. And the third level is one of father, or maturity, mother, so to speak, one who's learned. And they've learned something important. It's like Christmas time. The older you get, what was important earlier, they want to have uh, toys, they want to have this, they want to have that, which was so important. The older you get, the more you realize Christmas time, all you really want is what you can't pay for. When your children have moved away, you want your kids home. Or you want to go visit them. Or if you haven't been around your grandkids, you wish you could watch them open the presents and be there. Bake some cookies and give to them. Why? Because the toy isn't as important as the relationship is. Yeah. And that's what mature people find. So let's begin with looking at the child, when our child like faith. I run on to your children because you, your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. <laughs> the child, when we first come to Jesus, is so excited. I'm forgiven. I feel clean inside. I've been saved, and we tell people we're thrilled to death. Some of us, us become old and fossilized. Yeah, they'll get over that. <laughs> <laughs> and so a child is happy because it's new, it's fresh. Jesus, for his name's sake. Isn't it his name that saves us? The name of Jesus, that he is Savior. The name of Jesus, at whom every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Isn't that precious name precious? And so here, the child is happy. But then it goes on to talk about the Father. Around two fathers, because you've known him. From the beginning. When you and I reflect back, and I've been saved now, I was saved when I was 17 years old. I'm now 66 years old. Somebody do the math for me. <laughs> Well, 50 plus 17, I'd be 67, so I'm 49 years a Christian. Mm -hmm. I believe it's been that long. But the most wonderful thing when 
now except for Jesus, it was like meeting God for the first time. I'd heard about him, but I'd never had him inside of me. So just getting to know him, wanting to know him, and studying the word, happy I was forgiven. And so when you mature in the Lord, you're happy to know him. Because the older you get, the more you realize you better know him. Because one of these days we're going to be asked to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And you and I aren't going to want to walk alone. We're going to want to walk with the Lord who said, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. Who said that his rod and his staff, they would comfort us. Who promised us that he would get us to heaven. And when we die, We'll know. One person was laying in her bed dying in the hospital. Not to do this poor lady who was so poor. And she, he said, any kind of sand that can come to the end of your life, any you this so poor, in your laying here dying, in this condition. It's, she says, isn't that so wonderful? He said, why? I am so poor, but yet God loves me, and I know him, and I'm about to go to be with him. And even though I'm so poor, I'm about to go to my mansion, he promised me. Amen? Right. You and I may be poor, but we're rich in faith. We're heirs with God. We're heirs with Jesus and joint heirs. And so he says, you know me. And then he goes on to describe this young man. I've written unto you, young man, because you've overcome the wicked one. Anybody who's walked along with Jesus realizes that they're going to be attacked. It's all said the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And deliver us not from temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. What did Jesus say? Not only do we glorify God, who we worship, not only do we ask him for daily bread and forgiveness as we sin each day, but we daily have spiritual warfare and problems because the tempter has come and tries to sidetrack us, get us away from the Lord. Amen. You want to know what I think after 42 years in ministry? Eight and a half years preparing for ministry and then going on for a master's degree. Thirty years as full-time pastor. Serving in other capacities as part-time youth pastor or uh, interim pastor or uh, retreat uh, uh, ministry or as an evangelist traveling. And Satan has so tied up the average church because they forgot how to resist temptation and they have forgotten how to ask to be protected from the evil one. Instead of words many times in churches that are blessed, that Ephesians said should be seasoned with salt, James says, rather, many times our tongues are set on fire by hell. 
And James said, don't be wise in your own conceit. If what you said has created strife and division and jealousy and all kinds of manner of evil, because our tongues are unruly, our tongues are ungovernable, and if we don't pray, Lord, don't let me be tempted. Help me. Don't let me give in to the evil one. Help me. That people are left in bondage. I've been a minister amongst many Americans. And I'm going to tell you something. What I'm going to describe isn't limited to Native Americans. I go to plenty of other churches, white churches, other kinds of churches. And trust me, the same spiritual issues that are there are here. And they may manifest a little bit different, but they're still here. You say, what are you talking about? Oftentimes you can find the person who's spiritually stunned in their growth. And oftentimes they've got goofy ideas. I mean, they're just off on the anger. Or they're always critical, cross-eyed. And I was, you know, uh, putting people in their place, putting them down. Why? Because they're like the accuser of the brethren. Like Satan. <laughs> And what happens is not only is their life stunted, but the typical church at times is stunted. How so? You could go across the land and at times go in churches and there's no sense of the presence of God. No sense of the presence of the Holy Spirit. No sense of the presence of the Lordship of Jesus Christ leading on the victory. Instead of the uh, what we ought to be, we excuse ourselves by simply saying we're a hospital for sinners. And we enjoy laying in our spiritual beds, lulled asleep by the devil. You ought to go out and you witness, no, I'm all tied up. <laughs> you want to go on a mission trip? No, the devil's got me down. How about if we have a prayer meeting? Nah, I'm kind of feeling puny today. <laughs> and so all the excuses in the world on why we're not what we're doing and we claim to be a hospital for sinners. In fact, I think we're not a hospital for sinners. Rather, we're a manufacturing plant for crazy glue and sit on some glue and say, I will sit here and I will not be moved. I will sit here and I will not be moved. You can't make me do a thing, brother, because I will not move. <laughs> Matter of fact, the only thing we're concerned about, not a lost person, but we're concerned about whether somebody took our seat. That's my crazy hit spot. <laughs> so you and I need to be concerned about what Jesus was concerned about. And a young person realizes they're being tripped up. They're not living the way they need to. And they say, what's going on? And say, so read Matthew 4. Satan came to tempt her to Jesus and tempted him, and now he's come to you to tempt you. He's going to tempt you to do drugs. He's going to tempt you to get drunk. He's going to tempt you to go ahead and do things you ought not to do. He's going to try to mess up your life because if they come up with nothing, kill, steal, and destroy. And you've got to decide whether you can get them into temptation, and you've got to decide whether you're going to fight. My friends, we weren't meant simply to be a hospital for sinners, but you and I were called in Timothy to be soldiers of Jesus Christ. People who Jesus said when we're in his army, then upon this rock, the name of Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection, his precious blood on the cross of Christ, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
Jesus said, how shall you steal the goods from a strong man? How are you going to steal what he has unless you first bind him? Jesus was referring to Satan. Before you go in this house, before you come to this church, you and I need to pray. God, bind Satan from disturbing our church. God, bind the demons from singing the lullaby to us to put us to sleep. Instead of being excited about God and his word, a lot of times all we're doing is he sure is all good today. Yep. Don't he know that I don't want to stay in line for 10 minutes? I'm going to go up to eat. And spiritual food and nourishment is being provided here. Right. And yet we're more concerned about going to Dairy Queen or going to the Golden Arches or some buffet place. But a young man who says, okay, if I'm going to follow Jesus, I'm about to learn how to fight. How do I fight? You and I need to realize contained within the Lord's prayer. He gave us a resource. The number one way for Satan to defeat you, defeat me, is to allow, for you and I, to allow a sinful lifestyle. And if there's some hang-up that you and I have and give in to all the time, and we sin, and we sin, and we sin, the Bible calls that a stronghold. What's a stronghold? If you're ever in a fight, and we were in Vietnam, the Vietnamese doesn't have to have the entire jungle. All they have to do is have a treetop. All they have to do is be in the woods, a place where you can't see them. And all he has to do is be shooting at you, and he may not hit you, but he'll sure pin you down and stop you from doing what you ought to do. So you and I need to realize, Satan, you can't have me because the blood of Jesus Christ cleansed me. And he says, you sinned, that's right. But I ask Jesus for forgiveness, and I ask Jesus to give me his righteousness. And whatever yieldedness, whatever stronghold I've given to you, I take back and I put back into the blood of Jesus Christ and I give my life back to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ sets us free. Amen? Amen. Right. And Jesus Christ, if we're asking, will even remove the crazy to off our pants. <laughs> and he'll put some gospel shoes on you. Gospel shoes meant to go out and share the gospel. Gospel shoes meaning to give you peace in the middle of the war. You ever been in a fight? If you know how to fight, you're not that concerned because you're going to bam, bam. You and I don't fight in our own strength. We fight in the strength of the Holy Spirit of God through us and the name of the Lord Jesus through us and Jesus Christ with us. The Bible says we're to uh, come in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? When we come to the Father, when we come to the Lord Jesus, we're ascending to the very throne of God, Hebrews says. And there we ask Jesus, help me, strengthen me, fight through me, overcome through me. And Jesus said, Go ye therefore into all nations preaching the gospel. And Jesus in the Great Commission says also that we're to go and we're to teach. We're to make disciples, teaching them to observe all things. We're to baptize people, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we're also to know, Lo, I am with you, even unto the end of the world. You and I are not doing it ourselves. When we finally get up and we ask him to go with us, we ask the Holy Spirit to fill us, we ask Jesus Christ to flow through us, Amen. I'm with you. When you go out there, you're afraid to talk to somebody, but you say, Jesus, talk through me. Amen. Jesus, I'm afraid to give him a track. Jesus, please do it for me. Jesus, I'm afraid to rebuke the devil. Jesus, rebuke the devil through me, through me. Jesus, I can overcome. You overcome through me. 
It is that Christ-like life. Paul describes it. I desire to know him, to know him in the power of his resurrection, to be made conformable unto his death. He died on the cross, not only to wash my sins away, but Jesus died on the cross to take that sinful nature and crucify it so it no longer dominates me to die on the cross, to die to myself, to walk in the resurrection power of Christ. No longer I, as Paul says, that's alive. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live in the life that I now live. I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me, who loved me and died for me. When Jesus was around, he says, it's me that I go to Samaria. And he got up and he walked. And he walked and he walked. There he met a woman at the well. Another time he went to another place. And Zacchaeus climbed on the tree. And he wanted to see Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, Zacchaeus, come down. For I'm going to your house. When he was in Samaria, he could not be in Jerusalem as a man. When he was in Jerusalem, he could not be in Caesarea as a man. But as the man, God, Christ Jesus, when Jesus said, when I rise, when I go back to heaven, when I send the Holy Spirit of God, greater work shall you do than what I've done. Guess what? Jesus wants to walk in some of these homes in Oakland. Yeah. What's that place down the road? Ken or Ken? In Kashab. What's the place up with the good chicken up there on it? <clears throat> oh, dear. <coughs> Jesus wants to walk there, but he's chosen not to walk physically there, nor drive there. But he has decided to drive through you, to walk through you, to walk with you, to speak to people. Whoa, I am with you. He's not sending you by yourself and saying, bop, 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 go ahead. He's saying, if you're bop, 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 let me do it through you. And as a person's witnessing and trying to tell that other person about Jesus, the Lord is there, his angels are there around, the ministers of salvation. The Holy Spirit of truth is bearing witness through you. And all of a sudden, you get up enough courage. Now, I can remember my wife having witness to a young lady she had worked with. And years later, this young lady, who was not a Christian, came to visit us. And she was with us three days. And my wife said, let's go walk. And she says, I want to talk with you. She says, why do you think I've come here? I've been waiting for you to talk to me. I've been waiting for you to talk to me. Please tell me about Jesus. And so my wife told her about Jesus, and she asked Jesus into her heart. And over the years, she'd come and tell us how she was excited serving the Lord in the church here or there. And God wants to do that. Amen? So he wants to minister. And so that young man knows to put on the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, shield of faith, sword of the spirit, breastplate of righteousness, belt of truth, feet shot with preparation of the gospel of peace. He's learned to use the name of Jesus. He's learned to plead the blood of Jesus. They overcame him, uh, Satan, with the blood of the Lamb, the word of the testimony. And he loved out their life unto death. Let's all say, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ. 
I plead the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's all say that. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ. So if you go home and there's a spirit trying to intimidate you, a uh, spirit of fear, you tell that spirit, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ. Say it with me. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ. And Paul said to that person who was possessed with the demon, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out. Let's say that. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out. Most likely, we're going to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke you. Say, say that. In the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke you, Satan. He's made us to overcome. To be victors in Him. Luke chapter 10. He told his disciples, I command you to go out two by two. You're to cast out devils, you're to heal the sick. Later they came back. Jesus had described as seeing Satan fall as lightning from heaven. And the disciples were rejoicing. They said, even the spirits have to obey us in your name. Jesus said, rejoice not that the spirits obey you in my name, but rather rejoice that your names are written in the book of life. What does that mean? Praise God that we've got victory over the evil one, but praise God we're part of the family of God made possible through the blood of Jesus where the angels wrote our names in the book of life. How will that all happen? I realize some people say it was in the beginning. Well, however it is, it is. It's in there. Amen? Amen. I think that would be one of the first things you and I do when we get to heaven. We're through hugging everybody, seeing our home, seeing our mansion, seeing Jesus, seeing uh, the angels, seeing the throne of God. Seeing lots of stuff, we're going to say, What's that? Let's say the book of life. Can I go up to the book of life? Yeah, everybody does. Can I find out? Yes, you can. And he, in the turn of the page, <gasps> there is my name. And that's something. Oh, don't say. <laughs> but do you know what's going to be hard? If you and I begin looking and see, is grandma or grandpa, or your husband or your kids or your grandkids, are they coming yet? When the answer is no, their names are not written. You and I are not going to be happy campers. You and I are going to hope and pray. You ever notice how dead people want people who are not saved to be saved? Remember in Luke chapter 16 when uh, the dead uh, rich man and Lazarus were dead? The rich man pled, please let Lazarus go tell my poor brothers. He was more evangelistic than any Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, or whoever you want to name. Because he knew he was in heaven. He knew they were coming. Let somebody tell them about Jesus. And the only hope I can give you is somehow when somebody gets the crazy glue off their keister and they go out and finally tell somebody about Jesus. And that person prays. The Bible says when that person repents, there is joy in the presence of angels. What does that mean? The angels that are here, Hebrew says they're heir, they're protectors, they're ministering spirits of them that are heirs of salvation. When they witness a person except Jesus, they apparently go to heaven to make a proclamation. And perhaps at that time, they make certain that that name stays written in that book of life or writes it in the book of life. And when the hell 
Your husband or your children or your grandchildren have just been born again, just accepted Jesus. What are you going to do in heaven? You're going to be shouting, please, Jesus, hallelujah, they're coming home. You want to get some shouting in heaven? Go witness to someone. Now, shout a tenth this week. We had a woman gloriously saved. One of the people having real struggles years ago came to faith in Jesus Christ about a year and a half ago. And she got one of her close friends and came, and the Lord really brought conviction. And I mean, she was uh, broken, and the Lord entered her life. And we gave her the Savior. Amen? Amen. And so Jesus wants, he came to seek and save that, those that are lost. Jesus said, go, tell people about me. And so the young person is happy that their, or child is happy that their sins are forgiven. The young person is happy that they've overcome the wicked one. The old person is happy that they know him. And then he goes on to say about the young children, uh, I write unto you, young children, because you've known the Father. A child, when he's young, not only knows his sins are forgiven, but if it's a, a work in progress, they're just so happy to know God. They'll sing about him, they'll talk about him, and be happy to know him. It's important to reach children. You know what's sad in churches? You gotta pull hands to eat sometimes and get somebody to teach our children. And Jesus loves the little children. And Jesus wants us to be instruments of him to show his love and to tell them and point them. So the little children know the Father. And then he goes on to talk to the young men and he says, I run unto you, young man, because you uh, uh, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you overcome the wicked one. If you and I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ or the Father, it's going to be bathed in the word of God. And the word of God is the sword of God's spirit. And we use it in overcoming Satan. You've overcome him with the word of God. And you've overcome who? The wicked one. Somebody trying to trip you up. But he says to the father, once again, I run unto you fathers because you've known him that is from the beginning. Jesse Henley was an evangelist and for years <laughs> preached Jesus. He's known as Hellfire of Jesse Henley because there wasn't a sermon he preached that he didn't talk about hell. And so he was at the pastor's conference, First Baptist Jacksonville, uh, a number of years ago. His wife was dying and they wanted to give him a lifetime achievement award. And now he's an older man. Many of the people that were there would gather around up in his uh, uh, attic where he had a study. Adrian Rogers would go there. Jerry Vines, other ministers would go there. He would talk to them, teach them, instruct them. He was an uh, excellent Greek scholar, and he would just pour over the word with them, pour his life into them. And now he's up there receiving his reward. He says, I can't stay long. He says, my wife's dying of cancer, and she does not have long to live. He says, I have spent everything I've got trying to help my wife. He says, I'm telling you right now that I'm broke, and I don't have anything. I've lost everything I've had in this life. And he says, I'm telling you, all I have left is God. And he says, and I'm telling you right now, God 
is enough. Because of the Father who that was the Heavenly Father knows that we're all eventually going home. And He's enough. He loved us. He sent Jesus. He calls us. He saves us. He walks with us. He helps mature us. He helps us overcome the wicked one. He helps know us. And we know Him. And now we're going to be with him. So what are you, where are you in your spiritual walk? And I will just challenge you with one thing with Jesus trying to disciple people. And Jesus said, come and see. To people that did not know him, when Peter didn't know him, Andrew didn't know him, Philip didn't know him, come and see. And so they watched him. They followed him and they realized he was the Messiah. They realized he's the coming Savior. And then he said, Come and follow me. Now he said, Learn from me as a disciple. Learn how I live. Learn how I walk. Learn how I minister. Learn what I say. And then he said, The third level. Now follow me, and I will teach you to be fishers of men. I will teach you how to win a lost person. You and I will see crowns of reward in heaven for everyone you and I have touched. People who help me get here to Kashada Indians and other places, I tell people when I was up in Minnesota, and uh, by God's grace being up there, saw 20 something natives come to faith in Jesus while I was there. And I told the people, every one of you that's in this room that helped me get there, you're standing there with me getting your crown of reward to you because I didn't go alone. Amen. Amen. And then Jesus also said, not only come and see, come and follow me, come and I will make you fishers of men. But Jesus said, now I want you to bear fruit. I want you to bear more fruit. I want you to bear much fruit. You and I can have no fruit. That's also in the discussion since branch is worthless. You know what a uh, worthless branch is on a fruit tree? What are they called? Sucker branches. Mm -hmm. Cut them off. All they do is drain them away. Throw them away. And Jesus warned us that that's all you're going to be. You might as well be cut off because it is ruining it for everybody else. <laughs> and he says, but now I'll bear fruit. And once we learn to bear fruit, bear more fruit. And once we learn to bear more fruit, bear much fruit. That the Father might be glorified. What does that mean? The lost person needs to be brought to faith in Jesus. And that next chair that is following Jesus says, let me tell you about Jesus. That other person who's also learning how to be a fisherman is helping that one learn how to be a fisherman, and they're both trying to get that person saved, and they're both trying to get that person to be a disciple. And then they're trying to get that person in the next year to begin winning people and really growing and maturing. The person bearing fruit, much fruit, more fruit, is trying to assist every other person, not just persons, but persons, discipling them, getting them where they mature and develop and grow. They're simply not sending the church concerned about themselves. They're concerned about other people. You hearing me? Yeah. That's why I pray that this ministry will get out into the reservations. Because there's so many spiritual uh, resources, how to get saved once you say how to grow. And if you want to learn how to minister amongst Native Americans, even how to get a uh, Bible education for free to develop people to mature. Amen. Okay. What about overall? How many people need to come and see? Seven out of ten people who come to church is because somebody said, will you come to church? What about Oberlin? How many people have been saved and are sitting there 
wondering what to do with themselves. And they need to be introduced on how to listen to the Spirit of God, how to listen to Jesus. You can be in the ministry and not know that. As a youth pastor, this one deacon said, how are you doing, fine? He says, oh, what are you doing? He started telling him about different things he's doing with the youth. And he asked the youth pastor, you know, what's the last thing God told you? I don't know. The next week or two, he asked them all over again. He told them all about the youth programs and everything else. And he asked them, now, what's the last thing God told you? I don't know. And he kept on asking. Pretty soon that person was avoiding that deacon. I don't want to be around him. And pretty soon that deacon went up to him. You're avoiding me, aren't you? Yes. Why? Because you keep asking me what God says to me. And I keep telling you, I don't know because I don't hear from God. And so I don't know. What am I supposed to tell you? He says, you're meeting with me on Friday night. And so for the next two years, he took that youth pastor, poured his life into him, and taught him how to walk with Jesus, how to be filled with God's Spirit, how to listen to the voice of the Lord, how to share his faith, how to mature as a believer, and how to walk with the Lord. At the end of the two years, he says, it's time. It's up. What do you mean? You're not going to meet with me next time. You now know how to walk with Jesus. Well, what am I going to do? He says, you find somebody else in this church, and you do, and you pour your life into them, and you now teach them how to hear the Lord and how to sense Him. Amen. And how to be guided by Him. How to win other people. How to mature. And how many people are there and witnessing fishers of men? And in how many people are bearing fruit, much fruit in helping other people? We're so into ourselves that we're more interested in winning a fight and a business meeting than we are winning a fight in a battle with the devil, winning the lost people to Jesus. <laughs> Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus says, unless you first bind a strong man, you will not steal his precious things in his house. Guess what the precious things in the house of Satan are? They're your children. They're your grandchildren. They're your brothers. They're your sisters. They're your mothers. They're your fathers. They're your grandparents. They're your friends. They're your neighbors. And he has them bound, going to hell. And Jesus says, bind the devil. Go storm the gates of hell before they go into the flames of hell. Grab them, reach them for me, and bring them to a saving faith in Jesus. How real is that? I close with this. I was in Blackfoot Indian Reservation this summer. So we were in Montana near Glacier National Park, which is up in the northwest corner. And I just met the pastor. We'd just been talking 45 minutes and we knocked on the door. Says, my car's broke down. He was an older man. He says, my daughter's with me. Can you come tell me? Pastor agreed to do it. He says, Robert, can you go with me? I said, I'll be happy to. We go. As we're driving, towing his car, he says, in 23 years on this reservation, I've never seen that Indian not drunk. His eyes were younger than the scum. Today is the first day I have seen him not drunk. We pull up. His daughter's there. I go over to the car, talk to her. She says, My dad is a struggling alcoholic. Can you please tell him about the Lord? So I leave her car, go over to the car that had been towed, and talk to him. He says, I said, I'm a visiting preacher. And I want to talk to you about the Lord. He said, something happened to me. I said, what happened? He said, several weeks ago, God revealed himself to me. I said, what did he reveal? 
He says, all of a sudden, I could see heaven. I could see the Lord. I couldn't see his face. All I saw of the Lord was brass feet. I looked around, and he says, I could see angels. He says, and so did you. And he said, the Lord said, follow me. And I followed him. And I looked over the edge of where he took me, and it was a flowing, flowing river of fire. And there were all these people in there, and they saw us, and they were trying to swim as hard as they could over to me, and they were just burning in flames. And they would try to reach up to me with their hands and arms on fire, and they were trying to reach for me. He says, I was too afraid to even try to touch them or reach toward them. And he said, and God asked me a question. He said, you're about to die. Now choose where you want to go. So I said, uh, let me ask you a question. I said, have you made your decision yet? Have you chose where you want to go? He said, no. I said, well, I'm a minister of the gospel, a minister of the Native American, so I need to finish God's conversation with you. You ever notice in the book of Acts, whenever Jesus reveals himself, he always sends a human to finish the work? He just doesn't say them most of the time by himself. Somebody else, Ananias, would talk to Paul. Somebody else, you know, would speak to him. So I said, uh, what you saw, you saw feet of brass. In the book, book of Revelation, it describes Jesus, who John had seen, walked with him as a man, saw him die, and then saw him resurrected later, in his resurrected appeared, saw him ascend to heaven. Now he saw Jesus as the resurrected Lord, King of kings and Lord of lords, with white blonde hair, with fire, as it were, flames coming out of his eyes, with feet of brass representing judgment. One day, instead of being a savior, having to judge mankind, and I said, the lake of fire you saw is hell. And the Bible describes people burning there. So let me ask you a question. Do you now this day choose to go jump in the lake of fire with the other people you saw? He said, oh, no, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. I said, then let me ask you a question. Do you choose this day to go to heaven? He says, I want to go to heaven. I said, may I tell you how to get to heaven? He said, please. And so I described how God loved him enough to send Jesus, how he died on the cross here, how he came back from the dead. I would promise to hold in heaven if he repent of his sins and accept him as Lord and Savior. Jesus would enter his heart, save him, and transform him, forgive him, and come into his heart. And I said, would you like to do that? He says, yes, I would. I said, pray with me. And he raised his hand toward heaven. And this man did not just say, dear God. He said, dear God. And when I said, forgive my sins, he said, Please forgive my sins. I mean, he was loud. And Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. And he thanked him for being buried, for being resurrected. And he asked Jesus Christ to come into his heart, save him, become his Lord and Savior. And after he got saved, his daughter got out of the car, came over. She says, I'm so happy, I'm so happy. I heard my daddy ask Jesus into his heart. I'm so happy, I'm so happy, because now my daddy's a Christian. Amen. 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 So there's a lot of people in this town. 
And let me tell you a secret. I believe Jesus Christ is going to come sooner than what you and I think. And I don't think there's that long to go again to take him with us. So get about the Savior's business as Jesus said, because there's coming a time in which night will fall on this earth and no man will work. So you better work while it's still time. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your word. We're thankful for Jesus. We pray, Lord Jesus, we beat the wicked one from us. Help us be joyful that our uh, sins are forgiven. Help us rejoice in the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus, the armor of God, the Holy Spirit of God, overcome Satan. And we thank you, Lord, that we can know you and help us be happy. And help us, Lord Jesus, come and see if we've not known you. Help us, Lord Jesus, come and follow you to learn how you did ministry. And help us, Lord Jesus, come and become fishers of men. And help us, Lord Jesus, bear fruit, bear more fruit, bear much fruit. And help us disciple other people. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Holy Spirit, you're working in our lives. Get the crazy blue off of us. And help, Lord Jesus, fill us. And walk through us and win through us. And be the soul of us, Lord Jesus. And bless us. And we thank you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you for that word. Yeah. God bless you. Yeah. Uh, we're going to